Cool. Thank you, Leith. Um, you're probably slightly tired of seeing me by now. Um, I'm not really, I'm really I'm not quite at a loss for words because I wrote a whole lot of stuff down, um, which I haven't practiced, so I'm going to read from the paper. Um, I'm sorry. Um, it might be short, which is a good thing. You get an early cup of tea. Um, also have to preface this by saying that I'm talking about one very simple idea that's linking two sites together. Um, but they might lead into some more complicated ideas. But those ideas aren't really mine, and they're not really fully formed, and I haven't really got any answers. Um, but they do pick up on, uh, on some of the ideas we've heard at the conference already, things like small data, um, making connections, and then you just get into the stuff that Chris McDowell is doing, and that's off on another sort of spectrum. Um, Having seen some of those talks, I kind of wish I wasn't giving this talk anymore, or maybe if I'd given it last week, it would have, would have sounded more relevant. Um, but there are ideas that are kind of floating around. It's what Virginia Gow sort of refers to as these shared ideas. Um, they're just ideas that, that, whose time has sort of come. Um, we're all kind of thinking about them. We don't all know what the solution is, but we're kind of thinking about the same sort of stuff. So it feels like we're going to solve it at some point. So, a little bit about the ministry, um, well, a tiny little bit about the ministry, just that we publish a whole bunch of websites. Um, our two biggest websites are Tiara, the Encyclopedia of New Zealand, uh, and NZ History, New Zealand History Online. Um, they pick up about 95% of our web traffic, so that's the ones we, we tend to think about. Unlike a lot of the organisations involved at NDF, uh, we're not a collecting institution. We do a little bit of oral history, we take some photos, but we're not a collecting institution. Um, we write text and we write a lot of it. We have millions and millions of words, both in print and online. Uh, where we intersect with collecting institutions is in the thousands of images that illustrate our stories. Is this going to work? Right. There's a, a very quick search, a Google image search, for pictures on Tiara associated with De Papa. Adrian, don't look too close because you'll probably find some anomalies. That's Google. Um, we are probably one of the country's biggest collection users. Uh, Tiara has 25 to 30,000 resources. There's probably someone in this room who can correct me. Uh, NZ History has maybe another four or 5,000. Um, when it comes to collection items, oh, like this gourd, or a calabash, or a hue, or however you want to say it, our sites tend to explain their significance. They place them in the context of the stories which demonstrates their relevance to other items. I'll come back to that idea of relevance later, but for now I want to talk about a very simple linking project that we're working on with Te Papa. We source images and other media from institutions like Te Papa. Most of them are available on Te Papa's website. And what we're doing in this project is not rocket science. We're just going to provide links between two websites. So if you see it on Te Papa's site, you can go and read more about it on Tiara by the link. And if you see it on Tiara, you can find the original version of it on Tapapa's site. I should just say why we're using Tapapa as a test case. Um, a big part of it is down to people, and I'm going to blame Adrian for the whole idea. Um, Adrian Kingston sitting over there. He not only came up with the idea, but he saw it as something that was possible, relatively easy, and worth the effort. It's also partly the synergy between what the two organisations and our websites do. We both take a national view. And in the case of Tiara, we try to take an encyclopedic view and cover off all aspects of New Zealand culture and history, in much the same way as Papa's collections have that sort of breadth of coverage. It's also partly the size. We don't use a lot of Papa's images, curiously enough. There's only about 500, so we've actually got quite a manageable set to work with um, on a manual sort of basis at this stage. Papa also uses persistent identifiers for, collections, for items on collections online. And we can't do this stuff without persistent IDs. Um, knowing that they'll be there forever, we hope. Adrian? We'll you Okay. <laughs> so uh, the process is currently manual. Um, it's basically a spreadsheet that we gave to Tapapa. They're going to fill it in. They're going to send it back. They've sent half of it back already. Um, and it's going to link our, our URLs to the, their URLs. We're manually going, to put, manually going to put that stuff into our systems. So that's not a major hassle with 500 items. At some point, I hope we're going to have to think about how to scale it beyond 500. I'm hoping we get to the point where we think, this is a good idea, let's go and work out how to do it with 7,000 items at Turnbull, um, or whatever other organisation we want to work with. Um, so what do we get? 
we're basically linking these two items together. Um, you can look at it on, where are we looking at? This is, this is from uh, Teata. So from here, you can see that, um, sorry. What you're getting from Tiara is information on the item's significance. It's, it's in the story on traditional Māori warfare, and it's illustrating the page about preparations and entering into battle. From the caption, you learn about its use in this context. So Tiara provides context. It signals why this thing is important. Same picture, different website. It's, it's even got a new name. It's the Taha Hua Hua. Um, so from here, you can find out it's got a different name. It's also a calabash. You can find out it's made from harakeke, muka, gourd, dye. It was purchased in, purchased in 1905. You can see the collection it belongs to and what it was influenced by. And all those underlined words link to more items that share those classifications. So what we're doing is helping people find the information that's relevant to them. If they're interested in the story, they can get it from one place. If they want the detail about the item, they can get it from another place. What you get in each place is what's most, most relevant to you where you are but you can easily find the information, find the other information if that's what you're also interested in. I'll just talk about some other examples that might make this slightly more interesting. Everybody knows who Abel Tasman is? Yeah, good, good. Um, I'm pleased. Just in case there are any over, uh, you know, anyway. Um, so what was I gonna say about this guy? This is Abel Tasman. Um, there was a symposium recently, GLAM symposium, helped, uh, held at Victoria University. Um, Eric Ketelaar from the University of Am Amsterdam spoke about um, Abel Tasman and the various collections of, I think, um, ship's journals. Um, I'm a bit hazy on the details. I think he was talking about the journals of the, the, the voyages. Um, different copies of these things exist all around the world. So some exist as simple scans. Uh, others are transcripts of the Dutch. I think it was Dutch. Um, others are translations of that Dutch. So you've got all this duplication, and that's not a major issue. I mean, as archivists tell us, lots of copies keep stuff safe. The issue is that none of these copies are linked to the others. The copy you happen to stumble across directly affects your experience and how you can interact with that piece of content. If you can't read longhand scans, are no good for you. If you can't read Dutch, the transcripts won't help. If you can't read English, you might be better, might be better off with the Dutch. It wouldn't be hard to link them together. Um, they're on the web, so it is just hyperlinks. So, you know, link them together. If you find one copy that's not the one that works for you, you get to the one that does. Slightly closer to home example. Um, excuse me. This is an image from um, what's called the H series. I think. I'm pretty sure it is. It's got an H on it, so. <laughs> it's, a, it's a collection of World War I photographs commissioned by the New Zealand government, and taken by Henry Armitage Sanders during the First World War. I said that. Um, so the Turnbull holds the original glass plate negatives, and other copies are held by organisations all around the country. Auckland Museum, for example, has copies and photo albums, and that points to the story of how the images were originally used. They were put into albums with captions, and the, cap and the albums were distributed around the country that soldiers and families could order prints. That's why they're all numbered. You knew you wanted H391, you got H391. So again, making a link between those things, which doesn't currently exist, um, linking to the originals, linking the originals to the albums, it gives people the chance to experience and use the images in different ways. If you want a high-res copy, the best place to go is Turnbull. But if you want to experience what it was like for a nation to see what the war had been like in page after page of photos, you can view the albums. Just making that simple link makes that sort of thing possible. <coughs> Back to Tiara. Yes, here we are. The relevance of items to item, other items. I've written a bit over the last few years about the way that something like Tiara, but really any publication, whether it's a book or a website, um, anything that uses collection items is it's kind of like the meat in the sandwich between collections. Where a publish, publication uses items from different collections, it's effectively creating an inferred relationship between the items and the collections. I keep coming back to the calabash. Its many names are part of the complexity, you know, as we've seen, but as are its many uses. As we've seen, it, it illustrates the story about traditional Māori warfare. 
But it also illustrates the story about rongo, or the medicinal use of plants. So within that story, it's suggesting relationships with, with, with items as diverse as other plants. Other plants, sorry, here we go, plants. An engraving of, Ma of a Māori warrior, a Lindauf portrait of Tōhanga, Tūhoto Ariki, and a cartoon of Maui. So that's, those are not connections that an institution would make from its item to other things. So through that story, we also have inferred relationships forming between Te Papa, Turnbull, Auckland Art Gallery, the Department for Conservation, and Godwit Publishing. All, some of those organisations don't naturally see that they're related to other organisations, but through that story they are. Some of these links even start to get a little playful, kind of in the way that Kath Stiles talked about NDF last year with the symbol game, where you can let a user make connections between items. This is from the collecting story, which is getting a little meta, but that's all right. It, it really picks up a really wonderful assortment of subjects, from Turnbull himself and his, his book plates on the left, the four pictures, firearms, Barbie dolls, um, teaspoons, the ever-popular teaspoon, they're not the sort of connections that a collecting institution tends to want to make. Um, but you know, once it's in the user's hands, those connections can start to form. So, where can we go with this? Um, at a simple level, item-to-item -item linking opens up a few options. We can potentially share our content more easily with other organisations if they want it. That saves them the effort of writing new content about their items. So we're already looking at that with Te Papa through sharing our content back into their pool. Tiara itself could actually use the information to update copyright or other information when the institution record changes. Or we could start to look at pulling in the descriptions of items for our sites to use as alt text for screen readers to use, you know, where a collection item uses a more descriptive um, title than the way we talk about it. We're also interested in, interested in sharing our content with third parties to build new publications, websites or apps, or whatever people are going to build in the next five years. Currently we can only share the text on our websites because that's our copyright. But if we have a direct link to an item, then it's easier for a third party to find the sources back to the image, and they can go and negotiate the reuse with the, the, the holding institution. Potentially services like Digital New Zealand could start using those links and the information to map our stories to institution records and then expose those relationships through their own API. And I was looking at Chris when I said that, but I think he snuck away. There he is. He's hiding. I'm looking for the gap. <laughs> but more than that, we can go back to Adrian Kingston and start to look at his suggestion that we, we start to use the items to actually catalogue the stories that they illustrate. And this gets a, you know, it gets a bit confusing, but that's all right. I mean, if you look at tiara subjects, they are at a very high level. Typically, the story title and the page title is, in effect, the main, the main subject which is fair enough because it's an encyclopedia and the headword is typically the subject. Um, but what if we used the items to infer more specific subjects that the story might relate to? From that, we might see the story about Māori warfare. So taking this image of a taiha on, on Te Ara. Yep. It's also a story about wood carving. This is the information from Te Papa. So it's a story about wood carving potentially about the use of materials like feathers, dog hair and flax in Māori society. So making that link gives us that additional story around that, that piece of content. So through that connection, it's also then related to thousands of items in Te Papa's collection. Now, not all Te Papa subjects will be directly relevant to Tiara's story, but by being able to choose which ones are, we can start making those direct links and link our stories to a much larger pool of resources for people. This is where it kind of starts, and I'm going to name check Virginia again, so that's, that's two each, that's good. Um, I'm going to name check Virginia Gow again. Um, she just threw an idea at me when I was writing this, um, which picks up some, on some work in the Netherlands. I think we're the National History Museum, which I think is an institution that doesn't have a building, is that right, Virginia? Yeah, probably, possibly. Um, but anyway, they, they built a website that basically joined up with some other websites and kind of created what was sort of basically a trusted network of sites. 
So where one site linked to another site in the network, that link got re reciprocated automatically. And that's the sort of thing you could then start letting your users do for you. If they think this is re related to the same subject over here and they make a link, that gets reciprocated and you've actually got, it's an easy thing, you know, there's two links going in each direction. It shouldn't be impossible, um, and it is the kind of stuff that Facebook does when it lets you tag someone in a picture, or that WordPress does when you allow pingbacks to your blog posts. What they're doing is they're letting themselves and their users be aware of a much larger network that individual sites are part of, or individual pages or photos are all part of. Of course, that heads into the ter territory of Michael Lasparidi's talk yesterday about when you actually join two collections together, it's not A plus B, it's A times B, and you get into exponentially large numbers of potential links. But let's not get scared by large numbers just yet. I think simply linking items to items is going to take some work, and it's obvious we'll need to work out ways of doing it automatically when we look at a larger set. Could we let our users do it? Could we just start sharing our data with such a way, in such a way that um, clever people can start making those matches for us? I, d I do think it plays into the work that Chris McDowell demoed yesterday, and I wrote, I, I wrote that without even knowing that Chris was going to do that presentation. Well, I knew it was coming. So, I, But it is making those matches across collections based on people is the work he's doing. It's the sort of thing that can be done automatically by the right person with the right tools. All we need to do is let people like Chris use our websites and collections and see what they can do. People are kind of easy-ish. So are places-ish. Some events are even kind of easy. They're basically just hooks that, connect our, that can connect our websites and can connect our content. Subjects and classifications are potentially no different. A little more ambigu ambiguous, probably a lot harder, but they're not impossible. I was going to call this slide Historical Accidents, but I didn't think that was a good title for a slide with the treaty on it. Um, <laughs> But it is the treaty. Um, here is the treaty. Yeah, it's not. Sorry, it's a really bad connection to make. Anyway, one of the things you notice when you look at collections is that they're never as comprehensive as you'd hope. Um, I'm going to mention Colin McCann because it's the trendy thing to do this year. It, it is that thing that Colin McCann is the distributed collection. Um, so collections are, are riddled with historical accidents. No institution has everything related to Colin McCann or any other artist. You can also think of the Treaty of Waitangi. It's held by Archives New Zealand. It's soon to be housed in the building of the National Library, but arguably it's as relevant to Papa's collection. And I've heard anecdotally that people come to Papa expecting to see the treaty. I think you can look at any significant artist and see how their works are scattered across museums and galleries around the country, if not the world. That's just history. Different things get picked up by different institutions at different times, and we can't change that. But for the user, it's infuriating. Why can't I see all of someone's work in one place, or everything on a particular subject, all together? And I have to apologise for this slide. I put it together. It's my attempt at a network. Um, I guess the beauty of linking all our content together is that it creates a layer of meaning and use that sits above our individual collections. It lets us all play to our strengths, importantly. Organisations can maintain their own web presence that talks to their mission, their collection, their community, their building, whatever they want to be telling as part of their institutional story. But it lets a much wider community tell their own stories that crosswalk all the separate institutions and collections. Through that, we and our users could create truly national stories using all the different parts held in different institutions around the country. So I think that's pretty much what I've got to say. It's kind of, I, mean, I know it's taken us away from the simple idea of linking items to items. That network stuff is kind of hard. I mean, it's very hard, but we do need to do it. I think, importantly, though, at the same time, we shouldn't forget about just doing the simple stuff. If there's stuff you can do to connect your collection items to other collections, just do it. It's a start. It gives, us, it gives more use and meaning to your users than you're doing. Then you're doing something right. But we do need to keep the hard stuff in mind. We need to agitate for it, remind people what it's worth doing. Do it if you can, and share the results with as much of the rest of the network as you can. That way we build the richer digital ecosystem for developers and our users. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, happy to take questions.
happy to go and have coffee. Yeah, I just Come had on. a question about how or whether the digital newspaper is in. Yeah, um, kind of linking network and you don't actually want end users creating links on, on particularly on, on Tiara or, or well, but, but I mean, we, New yeah. Zealand with sense yeah. is the ability to connect. Them. Yeah. Do you, do you the uh, so the question is around what role could Digital New Zealand play in this and there was another question about do you want people doing things on your own website. Um, I think the second question first, potentially you do want users making making changes on your own websites. Um, my limited understanding of that work that happened in uh, the Netherlands under the INNL.NL brand um, was that it actually suggested connections. A user could start typing in and get a look ahead suggestion. So if, if you're on a page about Rita Angus and you start suggesting that Rita Angus might be the subject, it will look ahead into its database and say, yep, we've got Rita Angus in these other places. I can't see why that would hurt um, if you had some, some checks and balances. Um, Digital New Zealand, um, yeah, great, great thing for Digital New Zealand to do. Um, I think they're in that sort of space where they have become really critical to the, the future infrastructure of, of our network. Um, we need to support them. We probably need to agitate them to get some more money. Um, Chris was talking about the work he was doing yesterday and he's sitting on a train doing that. You know, so we've got some really smart minds doing the stuff. We need to get them financial backing to do more of it. Um, does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got his hand up. <laughs> Chris, do you want to come up and take over? No, well, no I just wanted to, I mean, I wanted, to, there's something that, I mean, I was wondering what the links are that you're, that, that you're linking. I imagine that it's just a plain anchor tag that's just going from one place to another. Is that correct when you link your Calabash from one to the, from, from Tiara to, uh, to Papa? Is that correct? Um. Yeah, it's just because I just want to make a suggestion. Because there was, I, I was sort of thinking it through as you as you were going, and it sort of it actually kind of blew my mind a bit. Because you could totally do this, and it'd be really easy. Um, you should take a look at schema.org. So, yeah. so schema.org is is the Google, Yahoo, um, whatever the other what's that? Bing. And Bing. Yeah, it's a, it's a web standard. Um, it's it's around microdata and HTML. I'm just going to paraphrase as you go, just so, sure, sure. This um, is telling us to look at so you've schema. So you've got some HTML, and it's just a few extra tiny little tags that you put into your HTML. But um, what it does is that you can define people. So you can have, say, a heading, and just also add this little microdata tag within the HTML that says this is a name of a person. Right. On a link, you can put in a same as tag, and the same as tag means that whatever you're pointing to, so the calabash over in to Papa, is the same, it's the same entity as, as the Calabash over there, so it's all within the HTML. We could totally harvest that off you. Like, that's what, that's what, that's what Google We've and... We've got to win. Just like that's that. what Google and Yahoo and Bing are doing. Google and Yahoo and Bing will also recognise that it's a person entity, and so that Tiara would recognise that the page represents a person, and so all of us would see that it's a person page. Right. So Chris has just said that Digital New Zealand will harvest that information, but good suggestions. We should look into, and probably need to look at your end as well. It means that the yeah. linkages between your institutions are semantic linkages. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's really low, so, so, so straightforward to do. Yeah. We're, Tom. Um, I'm Tom Rainey from Bridger Williams Books. We're already running schema.org on our sites for authors and for books, so it'd be a great thing to do. Right. Uh, the one thing I'm cautious about, I mean, Google Books has been running Schema.org for about 18 months now, and they're still only running a partial implementation. So I sort of sit there wondering at times if Google still aren't running a full implementation of it, where you know how long it's going to take, but it's working well for us. Right, I'll try and I can't even paraphrase that. Um, but Bridget Williams Books is using Schema.org, and there are some potential limitations from Google. I'm just sorry, I'm paraphrasing, it's just the session. We don't have a, a microphone to pick up on the session. Sydney.
each of which is contextualized within its D space, each of which is technically a different record, and therefore is it ontologically and epistemologically the same object? And we have different users yeah, interacting okay. with those. So how, how do I paraphrase this question? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you the easy paraphrase. Because what I'm seeing with my students is that we're creating a generation of format line students, ones who love the harvesting of content, the exposing of the links, etc. But they're actually not aware that, um, A, they're different formats. Um, B, they exist in different places that have different ways of framing those objects. And so what they assume is that the calabash that is in Tayara is the calabash that is in Tepapa, without recognizing that there are different stories to tell and different ways to tell those stories. So can, as part of the sort of paradigm of reflection on the process, is there a way of incorporating some recognition that the links themselves have a story to tell? And it's the story, like Sue Kemish says, it's evidence of me and it's evidence of you, but it's not exactly the same story. This could be a movie called Paraphrase. <laughs> 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 and I'm just getting too tired to even uh, think about that. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it, it takes me into the realm of thinking um, for the majority of our users, are they worried about that? Yeah. Um, are they worried about that now? Is it a story we need to record in some sort of way, but it becomes more interesting further down the line? Um, well, two I, examples, if I can just... I mean, I, 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 yeah. Here. yeah. Mm. They're not including the URL to papers passed and therefore not exposing that information. Mm. I, I, I guess, sorry to jump in before you get to your second example. Um, in, in some ways this goes back to my thought that something like um, Tiara or NZ History or any kind of public publication is kind of a discovery mechanism for collections. Um, where we're sort of handpicking the, the really picture-perfect little things and using them to illustrate stories, giving them context. Um, we're not saying that that is the definitive record, and this is a way of getting you back to the source institution, which is slightly closer to the definitive record, because of course the definitive record of that calabash is up on level five, uh, level four, I think, in a glass display case, and by tracking it back, you can actually get to that definitive record. Um, how much we need to be telling people those differences? I don't know if, if they learn enough about how a calabash was used and what it was made of and where they could see the original item. I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, for the digital humanities in, uh, in the room, that might not be a good enough job, but we're doing what we can. That's me. Thank you.